We are live with Assemblyman Nader Saeed. Mr. Saeed, how are you doing? I'm doing good, and how are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing good. Uh, January 27, 2021. You know, we're almost done with the first month of the new year. So, uh, you know, we're looking back at 2020, Ru, and uh, we're looking at 2021, you know, with vaccinations and a new administration in Washington, D.C., and a lot of new legislation in uh, New York State. I really think, you know, we're headed in the right direction. We're looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. So, you know, with all that's going on, I got to say I'm optimistic and I'm looking forward to a good year, God willing. So we have a new president, Mr. Nader. We are starting a new era in America. I'm sure there is a lots of things that uh, are being undone. Some people are happy, others are not happy, but that's that's life, you know, it is, yeah. you know, that's the way things are. We are not always perfect. We don't always do the things that we think is best, you know, and you, you're always going to have a group of people that agree and disagrees. Now, in this new beginning, sir, how happy are you with the way things start off? Well, you know, as I said, uh, you know, there's, uh, of course, Anytime you look at change, uh, for many people, change is always an issue. Sometimes people don't like change. Sometimes people demand immediate change. I've always been one that, you know, respects change when change is necessary and, uh, and not to change just for the sake of change. So having said that, uh, I think the change at the administration level was necessary. I think America whether on the local, national, or even global scene, was being perceived really as a big bully. You know, we, we the last four years, uh, pulled ourselves out of many international agreements. We pulled ourselves from initiatives dealing with clean energy and the environment, climate control. And uh, with the new administration, some of the first orders were you know, to get us back into the world community and get us back into a new mode where, you know, we deal with the climate control and clean energy. And recently, uh, our president uh, Biden met with, uh, or communicated, I should say, with the, with the leader of Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, to look at new armament control uh, agreements. Now, we all know that, uh, you know, it's important to also represent American interest and make sure we support Made in America initiatives and make sure jobs stay in America. So many of us, I think, agree that uh, there needs to be more emphasis on protecting labor in America and American products and, and build an American pride and American culture. But at the same time, you know, I'm an advocate of we're all citizens of the globe. We are, we're a global community. So not only do we have to become aware of the global issues and concerns, we got to realize we're part of an international community. And being part of the international community, you got to work together. You got to work with your allies all across the world. And you got to make sure you confront issues like global, uh, climate control and environmental issues and the issue of uh, plastics being disposed in the oceans. You know, these are issues that, you know, for many of us are very crucial. And in New York State, you know, we've passed major legislation and we try to set the tone for the rest of the nation that, you know, New York State is not only a progressive state, but we feel we're one of the most diversified states, the makeup of our community, the makeup of our government, of our industry is such where, you know, we represent the global international community right here in communities like Yonkers and New York State. So I got to say, you know, we're on the right track. Uh, you know, we're becoming now part of the world community. We're open in dialogue and dialogue is always the best way at every level. There's issues, communicate, resolve them, find common ground 
And when you find common ground, Rue, that avoids the polarization that we're living with. It, it has become so terrible how the nation has become so divided and polarized where it's not good for America, it's not good for Yonkers, it's not good for the world. So, you know, you know Mr. Nader, it, it's important to talk about the division that we see, but we are healing from it, hopefully, okay? Uh, I've been um, doing this for a few years now, and uh, I spoke with you uh, when, since you first announced that you were running for assemblyman. One thing that I never heard you saying was, uh, this is my people, and then there is another people. You always saw at this, once I'm elected, regardless of which party do I, I am affiliated with, you are all my people. Exactly. You know, the entire Yonkers, I represent the best interests of the entire city of Yonkers. And let's talk about how important that is. Yes, we realize, you know, you might run on this line or that line, but at the end of the day, when you become that, you know, you become that assemblyman that represents the people, then there is no more division. Well, that's, uh, you bring up a really a very important point, Rue. Uh, too often, you know, individuals get too, too attached to a political stigma, to a, a political affiliation, a philosophy, and they seem to be, feel that once they're elected, they need to prove to that element or their what they consider their major support base uh, that leans in their direction. And, uh, you know, I'm for maintaining loyalty. I'm for ma maintaining what I consider to be, you know, political principles, if they are, or social principles, where if you're elected as a Democrat, of course, you, you need to lean and approach and deal with what is perceived as a Democrat agenda, if it happens to be more social reform oriented or criminal justice reform oriented or progressive concerns. And, and if you're elected as a Republican, the philosophy is, well, you gotta be fiscally accountable and you gotta be you know, for traditional values and they interlink. You'll find people that belong to all political parties I, at the end of the day, you know, support candidates, but the expectations in our political process is, as you said, once you're elected, you're elected to a seat, whether it's a local, state, national, you're elected to represent all the people of your district. And you're right, I, I've taken the position, once I'm elected, to really reach out to all segments of our community and to make them feel a sense of comfort that yes, I got elected as a Democrat and I even had five other political parties when I ran, women's equality and green and working family independence. And now we know in New York state, we're down to four political parties. Now in New York state, you're either a Republican Democrat, you're either working family or conservative. So for all the individuals that are listening that have no party affiliation or they were a member of a party that now doesn't exist no more, those that were registered independents, women's equality, reform, green, these parties don't exist. So maybe this is a, a good opportunity to let the listening audience know that in America, in our political process, one of the most important functions we have, in addition to the right to vote, which is the core of democracy, is the right to vote in a primary. And New York State, you know, for many is being perceived as a one party state now where you have super majority control of Democrats in many local races on state races and so forth. So now, the primary becomes the major tool where you can voice your concern. Therefore, when you're unaffiliated as a registered voter, you're not part of a major political party, you lose the right to vote in a primary, which is crucial. So for anybody listening who doesn't have a political affiliation, you have not too much time 
this election process or the primaries will take place in June. The petition process will take place in March. So if you haven't yet done so, this is the time to pick a political party, whatever your political party is. Make sure you're part of a political party so you can get involved with primaries. That's a very important yeah, point. Mr. Nader, you know, I always ask from my guests because, you know, somehow I love exclusives. I like to know things that nobody else knows so I can publish it first. But today I'm going to sw you know, switch that around. I am going to give an exclusive. I'm going to make a statement. Uh, it, everybody knows that uh, I am a liberal person. I, I fall into the liberal classification. But what I love the most, it's the country that I live in. And I think that country comes above any party that you might follow. And I understand that a good politician, a politician that fights for the people for what's the best for, for the people, I think it's a politician that sometimes needs to go across party lines and needs to work with the other side. Because look, there is things that I like about the Republicans. There is things that I agree with. You know, I might not like the delivery method that they might choose to deliver the message as happened with the last, uh, you know, with the last president. Not that okay. I was always against him or against whatever he said. I just dislike the method of delivery. That was my biggest problem. And a person like you, yes, if you have to go across party lines because you think, okay, maybe this is the best for the moment, then that's fine. You cannot stay stuck on the democratic line just because you ran on a democratic line. Exactly. You, you have to judge at the time that uh, you need to take action. Now, before we go further, now that a lot of people are watching us, I have to say thank you to you, Mr. Nader, for coming into Yonkers Voice every two weeks, every three weeks, depending on how you schedule, my schedule permits, but this has been very successful. People are very happy because they can reach you. Okay, years before, before social media and before Yonkers Voice, I gotta throw that oh, one. Awesome. We were not able to engage with our elected officials as you uh, or the, the commissioners of this department or that department, like we just had the commission John Mueller. We saw them as an idol, an icon that we could never reach. Now we can actually ask you a question. We can engage with you. We can hear an answer that is happening at the moment. We don't have to wait two or three days for that answer to no. be answered. So thank you for taking the time, sir. Thank you for sitting down with us every two or three weeks as time permits. The people appreciate it. I appreciate it. So uh, thank you very much. Now, but, Mr. go ahead, sir. Robert, you know, uh, but uh, you know, the, you bring up uh, what we've always said, the importance of awareness, the importance of communications, and whether you're an elected official or you're someone like yourself that's disseminating information through these programs and newsworthy programs, it's important to make the constituents that we represent, the public at large, as aware as possible. You know, my goal is not only to go to Albany and represent Yonkers with legislation and bills and policies, we also have an office in the city of Yonkers. In addition to assembly members or state senators having offices in Albany, we also have major offices in Yonkers. And our goal in our district is to make sure that if individuals have issues with vaccination, for example, is a major issue going on, or they have issues with unemployment claims, or they have issues with a lot of the available funding for small businesses, they need to reach out to local, state, county, federal legislative members. And part of the program, our goal is to try to give out as much information as possible, to let the public know what are the issues, what's the legislation that members of the Assembly and Senate are dealing with in Albany today that would impact people listening. And very often, many of the key legislative changes or requests that we make come by listening to individuals on this show and other shows and 
and just communications in general where we tell individuals, speak up. There's an issue, there's a concern. If we can help, let us know. Just for example, recently, I had, I had individuals call me earlier this week and said, you know, Assemblyman, you know, the Super Bowl is coming up and uh, the Super Bowl starts about 6.30 p.m., probably closer to 7 p.m. by the time the, the logistics and the preparation comes. Now, if New York State, and especially in Yonkers, are businesses, whether restaurants or, or lounges or bars, for example, individuals that are celebrating for the Super Bowl, right now there's a restriction that, that by 10 o'clock you have to leave the premise because there's a mandatory curfew at 10 p.m. So what happens for many individuals that are watching the Super Bowl, they're at a facility, and then by 9.30, they can't order anything more because there's a cutoff. By 10 o'clock, when they're in the fourth quarter of the major, one of the major sport final events of the year, the Super Bowl, they got to be asked to leave the premise. So I looked at that. I said, you know, that makes real, real good sense. So we drafted legislative uh, requests to the governor, where to gov Governor Como was asked by myself, and I circulated this letter to many members of the Assembly and Senate, and we said to the governor, hey, through executive order, that's the power the governor has, let's for that one day extend that day, Sunday, February 7, Super Bowl, let's extend the curfew from 10 p.m. to midnight. It doesn't take away from safety precautions. We're telling these, these facilities, these restaurants and lounges and so forth, you got to continue to adhere with face masks, with distancing, with safety. But with the financial situation of these business, and many of them are ready to close, that's how severe the situation is, that it would be a good token, not only to support these businesses, but also to acknowledge that we need whenever possible to get back to our regular way of life. That's what we want. You know, we talk about the new year, a Super Bowl game, for example, extending the hours for two hours doesn't, doesn't take away safety. Well, Mr. Nader, you know, I never promised to agree with you on everything that you said, correct? And I have to bring you the other side of the coin and, and remind you that uh, not long ago, we were criticizing somebody else because of gatherings, okay? And we know how a game goes, especially the Super Bowl. You know what happens when we cross, the jumps, the masks down, the, the hugs, the, the beer, the gets together. Is it worth it, sir? You know, is it worth it? I understand the aspect, the financial aspect. I understand that local business, they need help. I understand that things are getting harder and we need to find new ways to help them stay in business, take outs or whatever. But is it a game? important enough to risk something like that because look i go there or any place and my mask keeps falling off keeps sliding yeah. down now in in the spite of the moment of the jumps go these that that mask is going to be non-existence and uh, are we willing to take that risk sir well i i i agree with you and i think you know part of this decision had to do with what's happened in this past week to 10 days in New York and across the country. Fortunately, the, the level of infection has been reduced. The level of cases, for example, of people that are infected has been reduced in New York. The percentages have been reduced. In fact, the governor himself in his recent uh, presentation to the public indicated that on the table is, is a gradual reopening of, of some businesses and some elements in New York because there's an improvement and the number of people that are getting vaccinated has been, you know, improving, for example. And to some extent, you know, our goal with the federal initiatives with vaccination is such where, you know, at least there's a promise there 
that we can restore. So I think the proposal of a, of a one day proposal extending from 10 p.m. to midnight, a two hour extension, in light of the fact that, you know, many of us love sports and many don't care about it as much, but we got to acknowledge that sports in America is a major part of the lives of many individuals. And I don't, I don't dispute that, sir. Yeah. I so if we find, if we find at least certain elements where, you know, we can adhere to safety and at the same time, it's, it's a token that's geared in the same direction that the governor and others are looking at from the CDC, Center for Disease Control and the federal administration. Let's build on that progress. If you recall early on during the days of the pandemic in New York and across the country, we had a tier system. We had phases of whether you're in phase one, two, three, four, and depending on your numbers of infections, you know, it was, it was a major factor in whether businesses were allowed to open, whether you had indoor dining. For example, in Yonkers, we have indoor dining, of course, with restrictions. New York City doesn't have that yet. They, they don't have indoor dining. They still have to resort to, you know, tents and other devices, many restaurants in New York. Many New Yorkers are coming to Yonkers, I'm sure, and go into our waterfront and elsewhere to have uh, meals with family and so forth. So I agree with you, safety has to continue to be most important, but I really feel that, you know, whenever opportunities present themselves that are reasonable, we gotta look at it for the concern of, you know, avoiding any further closures of business and, and really, complementing a major American sport and really allowing people to feel some sense of normalcy at this stage. Well, you know, I'm, I'm all for it, sir. I'm all to help, to help uh, you know, the businesses stay open. Uh, and if the, the governor signs this executive order and uh, for this uh, Sunday, Super Bowl, the seventh, I believe, seventh. I hope that people will take advantage of it. But guys, don't put your guards down take your mask, make sure that it's secure, a little bit extra secure, not to come off, enjoy, have a meal, you know, have some fun, something that we haven't had it in a long time, have some fun with friends, but be safe, stay safe, okay? Also, uh, if I may, you know, very important message, you know, it's been, uh, it's been very crucial on the airwaves, uh, especially this week, uh, the issue of the second dose of vaccination. So many individuals that already have had their first dose, uh, some, for example, depending on where they went, whether they went to the local hospitals here, St. John's, St. Joe's, whether they went to Westchester Medical Center, the county center, and some went to New York City hospitals. And what really became a concern this week is that Although many individuals who received their first shot had automatic appointments for the second shot, which is, in my opinion, a legal requirement that the provider, that the place you get your first shot must give you an appointment for the second shot. Why is that important? Because the two major vaccines that are out there the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine have basically a 21 to 28 day requirement that you get that second vaccine. So for anybody listening that received their first dose, they need to make sure if they have the appointment and the assumption is most hopefully have the appointment for the second date, don't miss that appointment. Because if you miss that appointment and that shot is given away to someone else, then you're at the mercy of whether or not the state or the facility or the provider would get a proper new shipment to have that vaccination. And if for whatever reason you don't have an appointment for a second shot, you got to make sure you call that provider and you insist on a date 
to have that second shot. Because if you don't have that second shot in a timely fashion, that benefit of that second shot after a certain amount of days begins to wear off. So you put yourself back in a dangerous situation. So urgent that you make sure, not only do you sign up when you're eligible for the first shot, you got to make sure you have an appointment to set date and time for that second appointment. So guys, this is very important. Okay, your life is at risk, your health is at risk. Don't play with this. Make sure that you are there for your second shot. You know, take it on time because there is a lot of unknowns still there. Okay, there is it things is. that we are going to learn. But this, we already know that if you take the first shot, you need to take your second shot shortly. And this is an automatic appointment. Make sure you're there. Now, Mr. Nader, about a week or two weeks ago, we interviewed a mom of a, a, handicapped, a handicapped child who requires lots of uh, therapy, you know, uh, in-house. Uh, the kid cannot go to school because uh, the kid uh, is autist and uh, have cerebral palsy, cannot have the mask on, so uh, keeps pulling it out. He cannot tolerate the mask. And because of that, he has to stay home. And by staying home, he's not getting the required uh, speech therapy and, and other therapies. Are the, the legislators taking that in consideration? And if you are, what are you been doing about that one? Now, that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, you know, for the listening audience, uh, you know, uh, people, people should be aware that uh, there's potential litigation you know, that's taken place now uh, involving, uh, you know, a, a lawyer that many of us got to know through the days of integration, Michael Sussman. And uh, Michael Sussman, on behalf of many parents in Yonkers, have basically began an inquiry, you know, requesting, for example, from the Yonkers public schools and the educational community, you know, to answer certain requests and concerns, you know, with regards to equity and quality education and the availability of quality education in Yonkers. And one of the major components in that is what you brought up, you know, the issue of uh, children with disabilities, special ed children. And the concern is to make sure that with remote learning, that seems to be the norm over the last year, that many children with disabilities don't have the means or don't have the technology or don't have the necessary one-to-one -one services that these children need. Uh, many other children, of course, you know, are impacted, English language learners and even uh, disadvantaged children whose parents can't afford the proper internet or technology. And all the school system has given laptops to many. Uh, the concern is if, if one laptop is given to a family and you have two, three children that attend the school system, then how can two, three children in the same household effectively get on one laptop? So these, these issues are being confronted. We have a state delegation meeting that's scheduled with the educational leaders and uh, we're, we're on to that. You know, we, we agree that there's many issues that historically has impacted special education, that has impacted English language learners, and really students that need the proper support. And I've been a big advocate in Albany for making sure we change the state funding formula. You know, I have legislation already in Albany that we're trying to change the major way urban school districts or districts like Yonkers that have a, uh, a high percentage of English language learners, that have a high percentage of special ed kids, that uh, have a high percentage of free and reduced lunch. These are criterias that really impact quality education. So we're, we're looking to make sure there's adequate funding because that seems to be 
at the end of the day, the major issue that we get back, that there's a lack of proper funding or the state gives other big cities like Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, a lot more funding for their kids than they do, for example, to Yonkers schools. And, you know, and now people will argue and say Yonkers has done an outstanding job. You, you speak to educators and they tell you, you know what? Our special ed graduation is one of the highest in the state. Our state graduation rate, our graduation rate is higher than the state average, even higher than more affluent communities. Or in many cases, you know, 30, 40% higher than similar urban school districts. So we as legislators, you know, hear these concerns. We, we go to the sources and we demand answers. And sometimes, honestly, as I said earlier, there's litigation, there's a potential of lawsuits when, they, when, when there isn't proper response and answers. But one thing I can say in Yonkers, we've had a terrific group of parents and advocates that advocate for children with disabilities and special ed children. And I have one person that I've made a liaison for my office, Nana Coma, who is very involved, for example, with the special ed parents here in Yonkers. And, you know, we communicate on a regular basis. And I try to get on as many uh, now virtual meetings through Zoom and internet to really reach out to special ed parents. We recently had a major, you know, rally for after school services. And, and, and there's a, a real dire need to make sure that many children don't lose that opportunity for after school services that are not only academically beneficial, but they're also beneficial for social development, for a lot of other areas that enhance student appreciation for life and so forth through music and art and physical uh, education and sports and so forth. These are the type of things, you know, we lobby for. These are the type of things that through your show and communications comes to our attention. As I said this week, I have a scheduled meeting with Board of Ed leaders. And one of the major items on this agenda is to find out the status of education in general, but more important, is there equity in the way we deliver services? Are we giving special ed students, especially special eds or children with disabilities, the services they need? Because I know you can give a child physical therapy or speech therapy or other necessary services online. So do we make special arrangements to make sure that a van picks up that child the child, for example, goes to a learning atmosphere where there's a teacher there. That's why it's important to vaccinate, make sure that teachers and teacher aides and school administrators and staff are fully vaccinated, you know, so that when, when we open up schools and the president recently announced one of his major goals is not only to enhance vaccinations, but also to make sure that schools are reopened. You know, but we all know don't reopen schools when it's still dangerous. So, you know, the amount or the level of vaccination really goes hands on, hands hands to hands with whether you open schools, whether you open businesses, and so forth. Well, Mr. Nader, that's one of the the benefits of having you there because you are an educator. You understand the problems. I'm sure that even before you became uh, the assemblyman, when you were a principal, and I met you a few years back, uh, lots of parents came to you with issues, problems, looking for solutions. Uh, talk about their struggles. What is my problem? What is the solution? So you understand both ends of the spectrum. So we can count on you to look for a solution. At the end of the day, the reason why you were elected was to find solutions for our problems. Now, Mr. Nader, as you know, this is a live show and we have people engaging. And uh, there is a question from somebody called, at least the profile name is Intellectus Prep. 
he's asking you this question. What is the best way to reach the assemblyman major? We would like to share our personal details for a new charter school in downstate Westchester. Can you address that? Yes, sure. You know, we always uh, try to provide the phone number and the email to call our office. You know, even through COVID, even through the initial phase of the pandemic, you know, our office has always remained open. I've always had staff, we've had individuals on remote, working remote, but we've always had the office open. And we've always made sure we answered the phones and tried to reach out and assist. And very often arranged to meet, very often on either Zoom, internet, like we're doing today, you know, with uh, groups and individuals. So just for the listening audience, the telephone number for the office, of course, is 914-779-8805. So they can always call the office or they can email us. And the email is my last name, Sage, S-A-Y-E-G-H, N, my first initial, at nyassembly.gov. So Sayage, S-A-Y-E-G-H-N, at nyassembly.gov. So they can email us. The office is located at 35 East Grassy Sprain Road in the Sterling Bank Building. That's where the assembly office has been for at least the last 30 years. Okay. Well, the number, it's also on the thread. It was posted by Priscilla. Prasad, pursued. I don't know if Prasad, I'm. Prasad, yes. Priscilla is the is the chief of staff here in my office. Good. So uh, the number is on the thread, guys. Point, you know, write it down. So if you need to reach the assemblyman to set up an appointment or whatever, you need to speak with him. That's the way to reach him. Now, let, what about legislation that is in Albany? I know that you've been very busy back and forth. That's why we missed last uh, last week's. Uh, broadcast because you were busy in Albany doing the work that you were elected to do. So well, legislation, uh, you know, you're right. It's been it's been busy in January and, you know, we have uh, basically a super majority in the Senate and the assembly. And uh, we're, we're at a point where we're looking to build on last year. Last year, if you recall, we spoke about the many legislative changes we've done with uh, criminal justice reform and voter reform. This year, you know, we've already started looking and passing legislation in major areas. One really major area is, uh, is petitions. Now petitions for those that are involved in, in uh, vote, the voting process understand that before elections, People that are interested as candidates to run for office have to get a certain amount of petitions, you know, and petitions is where, you know, district leaders and party leaders uh, on behalf of candidates go to registered voters of a political party and they basically say, Rue Ross, for example, wants to run for city councilman or wants to uh, run for assemblyman. Senator, I got to just cut you off for one second. Guys, what Mr. Nader just said is just an example. Okay. It's an example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just using that for example, you know. So if Rue or when I ran for assembly, for example, and I had, let's say, people that are supporting my candidacy, in order to show I have support, the process to get people on the ballot requires you to go, you and your representatives and supporters to get a number of people in your political party to sign what they call a petition saying, you know what, we support the candidacy of Nada Sayage or Rue Ross, and we, for example, attest to the fact that Nada or Rue is the best candidates for the seat. And in the, in the prior years before the pandemic, 5% of registered voters needed, for example, to sign your petition to be eligible. Because of COVID-19 and the dangers of going door to door, you know, we recognize that. So last year and now this session, we reduced the number from 5% to 1.5%. 
<clears throat> so in other words, by 70%, we reduce the number where it is much simpler, much easier, and honestly, much safer. So although we want the, some sort of a process to remain in place that assures that the proper people are seeking public office because you don't want to make it where there's no signatures required, anybody can get on the ballot. Then you know, you know, you'll have situations where for a city council race or county legislative race or any race, you have 10, 20, 30 people running. That diminishes the pool, people get confused. You know, you need a process in place that assures that assures that the best candidates are representing that political party. So that's that's something we've done again, petitions. For example, many people that with unemployment insurance, you know, have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And many individuals, you know, are eligible for unemployment benefits when they lose a full-time job. But what about many individuals that uh, had a part-time job or many individuals that can get a part-time job, but they don't qualify for unemployment benefits because, oh, they're only working part-time. So they can't make a living on part-time work. So they end up not taking the part-time job because they can't get benefits. So the new legislation we're passing this week involves a new process with unemployment insurance benefits that allows part-time employment, allows someone to get part-time benefits. So that's something that I think is major that would encourage many people, you know, that have opportunities for part-time employment to get the part-time employment and not lose that potentially on the remainder of benefits from the state for the lost income they have because they lost a full-time job. So I think that would improve the employment opportunities. It would motivate people to seek part-time employment and it would do the right thing. The other thing we've so, done- Mr. Nader, just before you go into the, to the other thing, allow me to in, in interject something, you know, because people are asking questions and people are expressing their support for you. This one comes from Stephen Simpson. Stephen says, Nader, Thank you so much for always allowing open and transparent information on what's going on in Albany and all that you do for Yonkers. You are doing a great job because we need also to um, put light on, uh, on what you're doing, that to, to let you know that, look, when you ask, how am I doing? This is what people are saying. I remember Mayor Koch, uh, many years ago, you know, we went on TV and said, how am I doing? Well, right. you know, this is the new version of how am I doing? You sit on Yonka's voice on a live broadcast and people will come in and express they can, you know, that they are happy or they are not happy or sure. ask whatever question. That's life. Uh, so what, what's the next, Mr. Nader? The other thing is, you know, we, last year we expanded voter reforms. And one of the major things we've done is we allowed for more voter registration. We allowed in, uh, young high school kids that are 17 year old to begin to register to vote. And that assured us before they went on to colleges where sometimes they get too preoccupied, they, they would be all automatically registered to vote. We expanded the opportunity for early voting. You know, we have a tremendous increase in voter turnout, which we want. A democracy works best when you have most of the people voting involved in the process, picking their representatives. We made it easier for people to vote by absentee ballot, where in the past, you had to have a legitimate reason. You were sick, you were out of town. Now we said, you know what, anybody can vote by absentee ballot. You don't even have to give us a reason. A lot of people feel with COVID especially, it's difficult to go and vote in the voting booth. It's difficult to leave the house. They're worried about getting sick, rightfully so. So it was a major you know, initiative that told every single voter, you know what? 
you can vote you can vote by absentee ballot the amount of people that voted by absentee ballot was enormous so now people are saying well if we vote and we want to drop our ballot off you know to assure that it gets counted in a timely fashion how do we do that so we made legislation that increases the drop off boxes for ballots so you can drop them off at libraries that so it doesn't have to be where you have to go to the board of elections in white plains you can now drop them off at municipality offices you can drop them off at libraries and we're pushing to expand the amount of drop offs uh, early voting for example where 10 days before the election starts the process where you can go vote that helps avoid long lines on election day and plus you can vote election day on the machine now the other issue was making sure that people get their votes counted immediately the absentee ba ballots for example the, there are an enormous amount of votes now in the past you had to wait you had to wait a week or more to get the results so new legislation said you know what we want you to start Board of Elections counting absentee ballots immediately. Now, to assure more people are registered to vote, we just passed legislation that, that basically automatics, uh, automatically registers you when you go to the Motor Vehicles Department, or you enroll at the State University of New York, or you enroll in adult education programs or classes that you're automatically registered to vote. Some people may argue and say, well, you know, we don't like this legislation because too many people are, are, are allowed to vote. And sometimes the fear of the majority, you know, is threatening for some individuals. But I'm an advocate of, you know, as, as I said often, we're a country that relies on democracy and democracy best functions when as many individuals are registered to vote, as many individuals are encouraged to vote. And I don't mean when you have 20% that come out to vote or 40% is considered historically. The last election, thank God, we had over 60% of registered voters vote that was the highest turnout. People say, well, it's presidential race, but I think it had to do, yes, with presidential, but we even had greater numbers historically than presidential. And the main reason for that is with the voter reforms. So I'm an advocate and here in Albany, we started to even expand on early voting rights, on, on automatic registration rights, on high school kids registering to vote early and now the main emphasis is to tell the voters make sure not only general elections but more important than ever primaries are very important being registered with a political party is very important because you can't vote in a primary unless you're a registered voter of that political party and as you said that's a process but it doesn't mean you hold on to it once you're elected. Once you're elected, you're elected to represent all the people. And what I do and what I encourage my colleagues all the time is look at the other side of the aisle, understand what the concerns and issues that other legislators and other voters have and be sensitive to that. That's what brings us together. You know, I'm a big advocate of consensus building, you know, let people sit, communicate, open dialogue, you have an opinion, speak up, you have a concern, speak up, you know, keeping quiet and being upset only furthers the frustration. And we had a lot of that this past year, unfortunately. Well, Mr. Nadam, you are not just an educator. You are not just the, the assemblyman. You are also an attorney. Okay. And uh, as such, I'm going to ask you a few questions. We just had ended an interview with the police commissioner. I don't know if you have a, an opportunity to see it yet. And uh, I want to see your uh, how how do you think about certain subjects that we spoke with him. It might be not be related to you, but you're not just the assemblyman. You're also a Yonkers resident. Exactly. And whatever issues I have as a resident, you might have it as a resident. 
are the cameras, cameras in the police department? Are you in favor? Are you against? How do you see that? No, let's not go into too much of a long answer because I have a few other things that I want to ask. Sure. No, I'm in favor of body cameras. I think, you know, too often it protects, you know, uh, against what many believe is police brutality. It allows us to also protect law enforcement officials from unfounded accusations. So I really think the body camera automatically sets up a norm, an atmosphere between the law enforcement officials and the community at large that there's there's an open witness process you know we historically relied on cell phones you know where people immediately you know there's an issue going on they grab their cell phones and they're taking pictures and so forth That's but i me. think the yeah well we all do that you know i think it's become a norm let's show the moment let's show if there's a potential wrongdoing or there's harsh treatment or uncalled force Let's show that. But at the same time, I think law enforcement officials would say, you know what? Historically, uh, there might have been some concerns about the cost factor, but I think with federal grants and other sources of uh, local and state grants, you know, many law enforcement departments are being given the funds to purchase the cameras. So I really think it's a it's a good good process. It's a good technology and it really helps us keep everybody uh, on target with but their Mr. jobs Nader, and responsibility. Now let me give you the other side of the coin and why some people uh, really don't trust this. There is a certain level of distrust between citizens, residents, and police department. I'm not talking about specifically Yonkers. I'm, talking, I'm saying this in general. In general. In general. We have heard cases that when we need those images, somehow the camera did not work uh, somehow we were not able to save the file and very often people think hmm maybe those images did not go well or did not go in line with how the police reported the sequence of events okay and that goes to when people are filming it independently from the police maybe across the street from a from where things are happening and the police tries to block you from that image. Well, if there is nothing to hide, if there is nothing that you don't want to be seen and now you're going to implement cameras so people can see what is your objection with the guy across the street from filming what's happening? I think, I think in general, it depends on some circumstances. In general, uh, there should be no restriction on the opportunity to film because I think it safeguards, you know, these issues from occurring where the camera got lost and so forth, you know, but at the same time, if, for example, the other side of it is if there's a tragedy, unfortunately, and, uh, and there's a bad car accident or there's a bad shooting and there's scenes of individuals that maybe the public at large shouldn't be witnessing right then and there till there's been some investigation or cleanup or, you know, if it's, so the way we package news and the time of how and when before, let's say family members, God forbid, if there's a loss of life or given notice, you know, that issues like that, I can, I can see where sometimes, you know, let law enforcement, uh, you know, maybe let's not be too quick to show that scenery that may be too horrific or maybe well, too much for the listening audience. So that's where the balance is with free speech and the opportunity to generally, like I said, I would support a right for anyone to film in public what they feel is important and worthy. Yeah, but you know, Mr. Nader, this is the beast that we created, okay? We ask for the live streams capability. We ask for these. We ask for the uh, raw news. Don't control the news. Let it be sure. the way it is. Let us make the decision. CNN has gone into war, you know, uh, and film live war events in Iraq, Afghanistan, you right. know, so we can see what's happening. But at the same time, 
I understand about the, the hard images that we don't want family members to see, but we shouldn't be censoring what somebody can film. I, I can understand both sides of the coin, sure. you know. I can but there's extremism. I mean, that's why any, this is one of those issues where if you were to take an extreme position one way or the other, people would have some reservations on that. That's why, you know, to say completely censor, I'm totally against that. You know, we live in a free society where in general, you know, I do support, you know, the freedom of, of expression, the freedom of voice, the opportunity to film in public, you know, shouldn't be curtailed. You know, only in my opinion, in limited cases where the visual elements or the views are so horrific where it requires a little more sensitivity. It may be in cases like that, I would say, fine, you know, but if you see law enforcement officials or government officials in general restrict any form, then I'm totally against that too. Well, I think it's wrong. Well, my question, I understand exactly what you're saying and I agree. My question was for filming regular incidents where there is no sensitive material, there is no then they shouldn't be restricted. Then they shouldn't be restricted. Yeah, there is nothing that can hurt the family. It's just an arrest, just an investigation. Sure. Let it film. If you want to be transparent, and if you're okay. sure that your police department does no wrong and they're just doing their job, then you should not have any issue with anyone filming exactly. that. Well, and now, well, if you're well, blocking well, a film from a, a reporter, you're right. then you're going to create the, the mental... Uh, think that perhaps those images that you're capturing might be manipulated so you protect the 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 the, the citizens from the truth don't protect me from the but truth. you know but this is similar to any field you know as an educator i was proud to work with so many outstanding educators over the years you know my involvement for some 40 plus years in education at all levels i've seen some of the most dynamic teachers and educators and staff members. Honestly, I've also witnessed some that I wouldn't want them to teach my kids. And, 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 and sometimes it required writing up people, uh, doing, doing legal procedures to get this person out of the classroom. You know, I've witnessed as an attorney, some of the most terrific medical doctors you've ever met and nursing staff and healthcare workers. But I've also witnessed serious errors that they've made that resulted in med medical malpractice, for example, for wrongdoings. And law enforcement is no different. I think anybody that tries in any field to say that everybody in my profession is terrific and there's no wrongdoing is, is not looking at it the proper way. So I think we all re realize that as much as we complement every field out there, there's good doctors and bad doctors, there's good teachers and bad, and same goes for law enforcement. I think we witness, although I, I consider myself, and I've said it publicly, a big advocate of law enforcement here in Yonkers. I think they're, in my opinion, they've done a terrific job, yeah. especially the last 20 years. You know, there's been major improvements and I think, but still, I supported legislation that promotes reforms in law enforcement and criminal justice. And I, I didn't view that as an attack on law enforcement. I it think even law enforcement officials agreed in many areas and said, you know what? Yeah, we have a few bad apples. And you know, when they do conduct that is unjustifiable, they should be held accountable. Well, Mr. Nader, I have spoken with uh, the Commissioner Mueller many times about these issues. And he himself said, look, there is always room for improvement. Correct. Uh, we realize and understand that there is some bad apples within the police department. And I can go even further. There is bad apples within the medical field. There is bad apples exactly. within the you know, uh, uh, legal field. Sure. Bad mechanics, bad priests, good priests. There is bad and good everywhere. Yeah. But, my question in regards to the cameras, I have spoken to the commission about that subject as well. And it says, Ru, I have no issues with anyone filming my officers as long as they are not interfering 
with the investigation. Okay, that's fair. Be away and film away. Film whatever you want, but as long as there is no interference. Now, what the, sometimes the commissioner says and what the police officers on the street here are two different things. But uh, he, as the head of the department, never said, no, I have a problem with you or anyone filming anything. Just as you said, you said, be discreet. You know, there is images that do not need to be broadcasted. Okay, so stay away, you know, and uh, do the right thing. Think that that person on the ground could be your son and perhaps you would not want your son to be filmed that way. And then there is nothing to gain by filming that. Uh, but filming the incident as a whole, it's yes. okay. Now yeah. let's move into something that is going on in Yonkers. And I, I, I think the entire state and probably country, fraudulent license plates, paper plates. You heard about that, sir? I read about that and uh, it's a serious problem, you know. Uh, you know, from our end, fraud, whether it's in the DMV department, fraudulent plates, uh, the fraud that people commit with unemployment claims, with small business applications. I mean, unfortunately, uh, maybe the times, maybe the pandemic, people feel, you know, if we can't go to DMV and they're not open for business and we can find an easier way, you know, to take care of our needs, whether it's you know, allowing me to drive, allowing me even with a fraudulent license to have one and utilize it, you know, as wrong as it is, you know, we need to recognize that uh, systems that allow for this fraud need to be not only be investigated, but prosecuted to the fullest extent to the law, because, you know, God forbid, uh, there's a fraudulent license that th that's out there and someone who's not authorized or qualified or experienced to drive is driving and ends up causing a serious accident or injury and somebody a loved one loses their life or gets hit by a car uh that's traumatic and you know so not only from the revenue perspective that you know new york state lost revenue that people went through an illegal process where they don't pay licensing fees and they don't pay and the state loses revenue for education and support services and healthcare. Put that aside, just the dangers of someone not going through the proper process is, is detrimental. So, it, you know, I know they're investigating this and they're trying to get to the source of, of who the organizers or who allow this to take place. And it's wrong. Probably multiple sources taking advantage of the current situation with MV being closed and uh, all that stuff. Now, to conclude this interview, Mr. Nader, which I'm I feel sorry to say because I always enjoy talking to you. So much to learn, so much it's information. Mutual. But we have to conclude sooner or later. So, uh, and since you just told me that you were a strong supporter of our law enforcement, Yankas, and so am I. Now, yeah, there is some people that I don't like up there, but there is some people that don't like me down here. So, exactly. that, <laughs> so that's we all we all have those issues. You yes, know? so that's okay. But as a whole, I appreciate my police department and I support it. Now, recruitment is coming up, and we need we need to motivate minorities uh, of all types, blacks, Latinos, whatever. You know, we need to motivate them to sign up you know you want to be the change then become the change sign up so a few words to conclude this interview that will help us motivate the people of our community to uh, sign up tests are coming up i believe se between september and november of this year you know start getting prep read get information so when time comes you're ready for that. Test. Well, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, not only in law enforcement, but, you know, that's an important message in, in practically every field out there. You know, the more we diversify the workforce, the more we allow more, more African-Americans and Latinos and Arab-Americans and to make sure 
that the diversification as an educator, we for years made sure that the faces of the teachers that teach kids should reflect the student body. The same goes for nursing homes, the same goes for hospital staff to diversify healthcare so that it's reflective of the patients they serve because there's more communication, there's more of an acceptance, there's more of trust when the person that's helping you or teaching you or treating you is understands your culture, understands your value system, looks like you. And the same goes for law enforcement. So when we complain as a community about diversity and we complain about law enforcement not understanding our inner city communities and our multi-diversified communities, the way to do something about it is to encourage a change in the makeup of that department. So I've always been an advocate of, especially with law enforcement, to diversify law enforcement, that the makeup of police officers and law enforcement officials at every level should reflect the community they represent. So when you have an inner city community like Yonkers, for example, have a diversified law enforcement team dealing with the community, I believe there's gonna be less tension, there's gonna be more respect, there's gonna be more collaboration and cooperation between the community and the law enforcement community so that we don't have to deal with a crisis every time there's a crisis that comes from elsewhere. That's what happens all the time. You know, when you have a crisis in an inner city community that involves people of color and you have an all white law enforcement team out there, that do, that's not reflective of, of the community they serve. So I think Yonkers, when you look at the police department, the fire department, you look at the teaching network and rank and file, it's a lot more diversified. And I've been in Yonkers 60 plus years. So I can tell you the makeup of teachers 40 years ago and today is a lot different. The makeup of law enforcement. For years, you never saw a person of color in the fire department. Now you have that happening. And it's happening in executive levels in city government. And that's, I think, something that at the state level and at the local level, we do a lot more. You know, that awareness of getting people involved in every level uh, and developing more understanding and now, more recruitment. Let me throw this at you, Mr. Nader. I speak with a lot of people, even though $100 seems to be nothing to you or to others. To lots of people, $100 is a lot of money. It is. Okay. Uh, do you think that would be possible that for uh, maybe your office, Yonkers Voice, work together? You know, maybe we can speak with uh, some businesses in Yonkers. They could donate some money because they make money from the community right right now they are asking the community to help them with the takeouts so uh we're going to help them with the takeout now the road has a two-way street perhaps those businesses can also give us a few uh, a few dollars sure. you hold it and when time comes for these tests you know, we set up some criteria, you know, how we're going to go about and people that wants to take the test but cannot afford that test, we would pay for that test for those individuals. Of, so course, we set, uh, of course, we set the criteria. Sure. We cannot give it to anyone. If somebody comes to us for $100, but he has a $300 sneakers, well, perhaps you should have thought differently, you know? Yeah, no, you're right. But well, then I, you I agree with you and count me in, uh, you know, we do... We do a tremendous amount of outreach in the community, whether it's it's helping with food drives and feeding the hungry, and we support many causes. And I've always been an advocate uh, before my days, even as an assemblyman, you know, to really get involved with efforts in the community to support. And I think that's a great idea. It's something that uh, you know, your 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 Yonkers voice and my assembly office can co-sponsor and coordinate, and we can get uh, definitely business people, local people that would invest in, in, in a project. And if we, can, if we can encourage 
10, 10 minorities or you know, candidates of color to yeah. take the police exam and help us diversify the police force. It's a win-win. That's it. You know, we can take that excuse out of the equation. Okay, you want to take the test? You don't have the money? How do you we go? help you. We pay for it. We help That's you. right. And we help the community as well. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to conclude unless that is something else that you want to talk about that you, that we didn't have time to get it. Uh, if it, if not, then we talk about it the next time around. So it's up to you, sir, to conclude. My this. pleasure, Ru. Uh, again, just appreciate the opportunity and to the listening audience. Like I, I always say, uh, you know, speak up, voice your concerns. Don't ever allow frustration to get to the level where you feel helpless. And uh, whether it's your health care, whether your education for your children, whether it's uh, police exams and recruitment, any issues that's of a concern, reach out to the proper sources. Uh, if it's a local issue, I've always said, reach out to your local city councilman. If it's a citywide issue in Yonkers, the office of the mayor. If it's DPW to the DPW department. If it's a senior citizen issue, it's a county issue, it's a state issue, it's an immigration, a federal issue, you know, there's sources. And if you come to offices and they feel there's a better department or level to address your issue, they'll refer you there. But unless you speak up, unless you outreach, you know, it uh, closes the door to potentially resolving that concern. So thank you, uh, you know, very much, Ru, for your efforts to provide Yonkers voice in the show and to allow me as a legislator to speak to the audience and say, hey, this is what's happening in Albany. This is what's happening in Yonkers. Even stuff that happens nationally and internationally that concerns each and every one of us. So best regards and hopefully we'll see you at the next show. Thank you, sir. This concludes our interview for today. Mr. Nader, stay well and stay healthy, you and your family. Until next time. You sir. too. Thank you very much.